Well, good morning. good morning. So it's not the one sitting on the sideline. I uh, recently got to meet a former NFL ref that lives in Coco. And I uh, actually, I think I messaged, uh, did I message you? I messaged somebody from our church and I said, do you think I should apologize to them for all the times I've yelled from my couch at them? You know, one of the funny things, and I don't know if you've, have anybody in here ever coached a sport? You've coached a sport before? So if you've coached a sport for any length of time, you kind of know this, that in the middle of a game or something, you might complain to the ref, but you're also smart enough to know that you don't want to be the ref. And so I'm very aware of that. And so over the years when I coached basketball, when I was an athletic director at a school and all these other things, uh, I actually became friends with several of the refs. And literally after the game, so many times I would say, hey, just so you know, I could never do what you do. Terrible call right there, but great, you know. And, and here's the thing about life so often. It is, you ready? It is easy to be a critic. And the worst critics are those who aren't doing anything. The worst critics are those who are sitting on the sideline watching the game. Because it's a lot easier. Listen, and I know it. I, you should have heard me at Magic Games. I was in the 4,000th row telling the refs what they should do. But if they had said, oh, Eric Brookins, Eric Brookins up there in section Z, nosebleed, oxygen level, would you come down? We heard you talking, and you know better than we do, so you're now in charge of the game. It's really easy to be on the sideline and, and complain. Nehemiah was dealing with that very same thing. And, it's, and, and the truth is, listen, Nehemiah over and over went to God and said, what am I supposed to do? And I'll be honest, when we finish this story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, you ready for this? It's going to be a shocker. Didn't get it all right. He didn't. You read the Bible and, and scholars know that Nehemiah made some mistakes. But you know what he did? He went back over and over and, and said, I want to do what God's called me to do. And regardless of the complaints, regardless of the literal threats on his life, which most of us can't say they've had, I've only had one for a wedding. That's an absolutely true story. I'll tell it another day. But, but the truth is, most of us haven't had that. And Nehemiah, what did he do? He just kept going. Now, I was really surprised to find out something this week that I never knew. And apparently, it's still ongoing. And one of the things I'm very aware of is no matter how wonderful somebody is, they are not perfect. Did you know that? Jesus is the only one that's perfect. So anybody else that isn't. And here's what I found out this week that I did not realize, and I've never really looked into it, so I wouldn't have a reason to realize it. There are people who think that Mother Teresa is Satan. I, I know she's not alive anymore. But they literally think that she's like the worst person ever. And I'm like, you know, even if you thought that, I could think of maybe one or two or more, right? I mean, just crazy. So, so here's a woman who said, you know what? This is what I feel like God wants me to do to help the poor in Calcutta. She was teaching school, and she thought, I see all these poor. And so by herself, with support from her leader, she said, I want to start an outreach to the poor. And of course, we all now are familiar with who Mother Teresa is because she helped so many people, you ready, that no one else would help. And it's hard for me to criticize people who are helping someone that no one else helps. No matter how imperfect. She was imperfect. By the way, if you didn't know, she struggled with depression. She struggled with major discouragement. Uh, her letters have now been released, and you see how deep her struggle was. And so I tell you that to tell you this. Right now, you might be struggling with a critic, an actual person who criticizes you all the time. But more than likely... Your worst critic is right here. Now, the enemy is going to use what you were told as a kid, what you believe about yourself, what you believe about situations. But the truth is, 
Even Nehemiah, who we see as somebody who was leading a rebuilding of the walls, that this now was try number three. By the way, you want to get discouraged, be the third one that tries something, right? And yet, he kept going. And so today, here's what I want to talk about for just a few minutes, how to deal with opposition. And I'm going to talk about how to deal not only with opposition from outside, because maybe you literally have a critic. I've had critics. I've had people attack me. Uh, I've had all kind of things happen over... When you've been a pastor for a long time, it's a great place to hold your hat. It's just a... It's a you just know that everybody loves you and wants the best for you. That's what you know, right? right? It's like being a coach of a football team, right? Right? So, especially if you're the coach of Michigan. But that's another story for another day. All right. Thank you for getting that joke. That was a very niche, very niche joke. All right. So here's what I want to tell you today. Don't let your critics get you off track. Follow what God wants you to do. What is he calling you to do? So in that is a question, what is God calling you to do? And if he's calling you to do something, you're going to get criticized. Things won't always go well. And if you quit too early, you will stop the very thing that God put in your life for you to do. If you quit because you're frustrated, if you quit because somebody says something to you, if you quit because of your own insecurity that you're unwilling to deal with, you will miss out on what God wants to build, not just in your life, but in the lives of others. So hear me out. Be really careful who you listen to. And make sure you go back to God's word and allow him to speak into your life so that those voices that maybe you heard as a kid, maybe that critic that, that maybe you have a consistent critic. Most of us don't have a consistent critic, you know, unless we're married to them, right? <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Right? But we know, and you all know somebody whose spouse is a jerk. Everybody knows somebody who, don't look at them. Don't look at, why'd you turn around? Don't do that. Right? We, but we all, right? We all know somebody who's like that. So thank God I have the most amazing wife who encourages and inspires and all that stuff. Not everybody does. And you may have somebody in your life that you're related to, so you can't just like not see them. But for most of us, our main critic is in the mirror. And that's the one we argue with most of the time. That's the one that's fighting us most of the time. And so we have to go back to God's word and let it be planted deeply to change us. So we're going to talk about confronting issues and remembering God, using time on tasks and not on our critics. If you pay too much attention to your critics, including yourself, you will just waste time. And then we're going to talk about speaking the truth and praying for strength. So number one, confront issues and remember God. And by the way, Please confront issues. Too many Christians today are just going through life and not really dealing with what's happening inside of them. They're not really paying attention to how they're treating others. There's so many people oblivious to how they're acting in relationship to other people. Why? Because they haven't dealt with their issues. So let's see what Nehemiah does about these issues as they're rebuilding the wall. Uh, Nehemiah, we're going to pick up in chapter 4. Uh, and somebody came to me last night and they said, Hey, hey, can I listen to the first couple of weeks? Because I missed the first couple of weeks. Yes, not only on our website, but we also have a podcast. So what's nice about a podcast is you can listen at two times speed, which is what I do which is a crazy way to listen, and it gets you all wound up like this. It's just, I'm two times speed before you do that. So there you go. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble, listen, that we cannot rebuild the wall. Every, listen, every self-critic exaggerates the problem. And by the way, when you're tired... <clears throat> Did I, did I say that out loud? If you want to get in a fight at home, wait till right before dinner and when you're tired. That'll be the best fight you've ever had. And by best, I mean dumbest fight. You've, many of you just need to be quiet till you eat. Because that Snickers commercial is absolutely true. You're hangry and you're making big mistakes. All right, so here we go. So their, their strength was giving out. And then there's so much rubble they can't rebuild, which isn't true. Which isn't true. That second part's not true. 
Also, our enemy says, before they know it or see us, we are ninjas. It doesn't say that here. I added that. We will be right there among them, and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Lydia was watching Dog Ninjas last night when I got home, so that's okay. Then the, you've got to be careful what you say to ADD pastor before he gets up. All right. Then the Jews who live near them came and told us, listen this, ten times over. And this is the truth about critics. They will continue to repeat something to you. And, and that includes your self-critic. You may have a thing that you say over and over to yourself that's just not true. And so he says, our, 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 they came and told us ten times over. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, what did he do? I stationed some people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places. I love this. Posting them by families with swords, spears, and bows. So let me time out here for a second. Single or married, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. I know you think you're an island, but you need people. And every once in a while, somebody comes and tells me, well, I don't need people. And here's what I say to them. I want to say, as a pastor, you're a liar, but I don't. Instead, I say, but maybe they need you. Because the truth for all of us is, no matter how strong you are, no matter how you have your act together, at some point, you will need other people. And, and if you're at a strong point, let's just say that you've got your whole act together, you have no inner critic, you're just wonderful and the most amazing person in this room. Like Ernie. So, so then other people need you. So other people need you. And here's the truth about our lives. We all have broken down walls in our lives. We have areas of weakness. And what do you need in an area of weakness? The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. That literally means to put a roof over. And what does that mean? Love protects those areas where we struggle. Love looks out for, tries to help us walk through it. And here's the thing. Eventually, those parts of the wall are repaired, but it takes some time. So work on those parts of your life. Don't think you don't have to deal with them. And by the way, the other aspect I see here of needing other people, some of you need a counselor. Let's just be honest. We all know somebody who does, right? We're all like, yeah, you, you really do. And, and by the way, be careful to get a good counselor. There's some terrible counselors. There are some, I can tell you things that people have come and told me in my office, and my first words to them are, uh, don't ever go back to them. Dufasi in the Greek. That, doofus, I'm sorry. I just, all right. After I looked things over, what does he do? He evaluates what's going on. I stood up. And I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. By the way, Nehemiah had to stand up. Why? He was only me and I. Uh, I know. I don't get credit, David, for that? Okay. <laughs> After looking things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Listen, listen. Do not be afraid of them. And here is the... Mo if you don't hear anything else in the sermon, listen. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your home. What does Nehemiah do? He gets up and says, hey, remember who you work for, and then take care of these other people. And here's the deal. When your family is struggling, when a friend of yours is struggling, when they're dealing with defeat, if you Focus on your family, which is a great name for a ministry, but the truth is that doesn't need to be your first focus. First focus on the Lord, and then He'll help you to take care of your family. If you try to get all your love and acceptance from your family, <laughs> right? But if you get it from the Lord, 
And he pours his love in your life. And you read God's word and you allow his word to be your counselor. Instead of everything the world is teaching and doing. And by the way, the world is a pendulum. They're just going to swing. And then they'll swing the other. And God's word is a firm foundation. So go back to his word. The most important. Listen, if you want to keep critics from getting you off track. The most important thing you can do. Listen. Spend some time every day in your Bible. I don't care if you read one verse and you say, God, apply this verse to my life today. You, if you've never read the Bible before, spend some time in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Just read a story a day and say, God, as I go, would you pour this into my life? Why? Because during the day, you're going to get drawn from here to there. You're going to turn on the TV and some news thing's going to come on and they're going to try to make you angry or afraid. I don't know of any other emotion they work for. That's how they sell stuff. They're going to try to make you angry or afraid. I don't, I don't care which news station you watch. I don't care. I mean, you can watch Bloomberg and they even do that. Sports Center does that now. ESPN used to be so fun to watch. Now they just yell at each other, right? Because they're trying to make you angry. I'm mad at coaches that I don't ever knew I was supposed to be mad at. Michigan, right? Right? <laughs> Beat out FSU, right? I'm mad. What? I don't even like FSU, and I'm mad about that. I'm like, what? what? Why am I mad? Because I let somebody else decide which way the arrow goes. So every day, get back to God's word, allow his word to flow into your life. And then here's what's going to happen according to Jesus at the Lord's Supper. <laughs> this is awesome. So Jesus' Lord's Supper washes the disciples' feet. They're arguing over who is like the most awesome, which is hilarious. Like they've watched Jesus cast out demons and stuff. And they're like, I think I'm better than you are. Like what? And here's what Jesus says to them. All this I've spoken while I'm still with you. And then he says this, but... The advocate, the Holy Spirit. And that word advocate is lawyer. It's having your own lawyer. It's having somebody fight for you. By the way, sometimes we don't even fight for ourselves. We show up before God and we're like, oh, God, I don't even know why you would talk to me. And the Holy Spirit's like, God, he's discouraged. It's awesome that God can pray for us when we don't have words. Isn't that great? The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And, listen, remind you of everything I said to you. So you can be the dumb, you can be as dumb as a bag of hammers in this room. Not be able to remember anybody's name. Not to be able to remember any verses. And you spend time in God's word. And the Bible promises us that the Holy Spirit, you'll be doing something. Or in the middle of something, and the Holy Spirit will bring back one of those verses into your mind. What God said. You're like, but Eric, I'm not that smart. Yeah, but God is. But Eric, I don't know the verse and the reference. <laughs> he doesn't need references. We, we invented chapter and verse, by the way. You know that, right? We added that later so we could find it because we were tired of going, where is that one? Where is that one? Where is that? That's a scroll, by the way. That's... <laughs> Carry some verses in your heart. Listen, if you're struggling with fear... This is what's awesome about Google. Google verses on fear. It'll pull up all kinds. Of, print a couple up. Carry them with you. Put them in your car. If you're struggling with anger, especially while driving. <clears throat> especially while I followed some of you. You struggle. And some of you that I follow, I struggle because of you. So there it is. Right? But the truth is, if you're struggling with anger or you're struggling in a relationship, look up some verse on that and carry them with you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's job is to teach you. And so he'll apply that verse in a way that God's never used it in anybody else's life. And that's the direction you need. Why? Because we tend to have outer critics and inner critics all the time. Whatever we're going through, we're evaluating, we're worried about things, we're carrying them around. The rubble is too much. The rubble's too much. I'm tired. And don't we make great decisions when we're tired? Just the best. You want to have fun? Just go over to Disney at 7 o'clock at night and watch all the screaming children leaving. It's just a great time for families to unite. <laughs> Number two, use time on your task 
not your critics. You ever get focused on the wrong thing? You ever get mad and you're so mad all you can focus on is what you're mad about? And like you mess up something else, you break a dish, you're doing angry dishes and you break a dish, which your whole point of doing the dishes was to get the dishes clean. Instead, you broke one because you were so mad. There's a story in 1972 about an Eastern Airlines plane and the guys were coming in for landing and when you activate the landing gear. I actually had a pilot come and talk to me last night about this because he knew all about it. And they activated the landing gear and the little light that says it was activated did not come on. So they literally had everybody in the cockpit except for one pilot who they sent down to look. He actually crawled under the plane to look to see what was going on. And they kept turning it on and off and it wouldn't work. And they were all in the thing. And during that time, the pilot accidentally bumped the controls with his arm and turned off the autopilot. And 98 out of 170 something passengers died. And here's the really bad part. The landing gear was working. You know what wasn't working? The light bulb. If you spend all your time focused on your outer or inner critics, listen, you will hurt the people next to you. You will not accomplish what God's called you to accomplish. If I spent all my time <laughs> with all the advice I've gotten over the last 30 years as a pastor, first of all, every sermon would sound like this. Because that is the way I was told. that I needed to teach. And listen, people have given you all kind of criticism and advice. That's not necessarily what God has for you. So listen to him. Don't let your critics get you off track. Go back to God's word. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of, oh no! My mom on the way home goes, wasn't that also the wife of that beetle? <laughs> they should have known right then. Breaking up the beetles. So this, was, this is the first time. 60s was it. He should have known. If he had read his Bible. Let's meet on the plane of, oh no. But they were scheming. What a funny thing for my mother to say to me, by the way. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. Listen, listen. I'm carrying on a great project, and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave and go down to you? Four times they sent the message, and each time I gave the same answer. Your inner and outer critics are going to have to be dealt with over and over. If you grew up with somebody telling you you're an idiot, every time you do anything, you drop a glass, you move something, you're going to hear, idiot. Over and over, you're going to hear it. Why? Because that's what you've always heard. If you focus on that, if you focus on what you can't do right, if you focus on what these people are saying to you and every criticism that comes at you. Now, I'm not saying, listen, listen. Some of you need to listen to some people. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? Some of you need to pay attention because if somebody says, hey, I'm tired and the walls are falling down, they're not your critic. They're your friend trying to tell you what's going on. But it's these people who are trying to hurt you and trying to attack you. We don't ignore the right people sometimes. And if you're wasting time dialoguing with somebody on Facebook you've never met that's probably typing something just to aggravate you, you are wasting, <clears throat> wasting time. If you are yelling at the TV when the news comes on, let me give you a simple bit of advice. Turn it off. Call a friend. Take somebody fishing. Right, Robert? <laughs> Recognize that sometimes what's fighting you is your unforgiveness. Sometimes what's fighting you is your anger. Sometimes what is fighting you is something you heard or got an opinion about, and now you're meeting them on the plane of, oh, no. Instead of doing what God's called you to do, don't go down to, oh no. Quit listening to every voice and say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do. And listen, 
If you do anything that matters, you're going to be criticized. I don't care if you pick up sticks at the church and you come one week and you say, Eric, I'm going to come by the church and just pick up the sticks and throw them away. Somebody will show up and park and tell you a better way to pick up sticks as they lean against their car. I, listen, I've been here enough times. That, had, that really does happen. That really. You're going to get discouraged. You're going to focus on the wrong thing. So I want to give you three visions. First of all, an eternal vision. Think about the fact that one day you'll be in heaven, and who do you want sitting across from you? So you need to start praying for God. I want to witness and reach out to somebody. Make an eternal vision. One of the visions you have, make a short-term vision, or excuse me, a long-term vision. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better mom. I want to be a better worker. I want to be a better neighbor. Start to have that in the back of your mind and quit paying attention to all those negative things and start to say, this is what I want God to do with me. And then number three, short-term. God, how can I love somebody today? God, today, help me to pay attention to your Holy Spirit that's going to direct me. Help me not to get so focused on the negative and the naysayers and the mean people and the people trying to get me angry all the time and the people trying to get me into debatable things all the time. Lord, help me to focus on how can I be a blessing today? What can I do today? By the way, if you want to be a better husband, one of the best ways is to pay attention today to what you're doing. Not to make a plan way out in the future, but look today. How are you treating somebody? Are you actually listening? By the way, ADD people, I have to actually have little talks with myself that go like this. When your wife comes home, you're going to look at her and you are going to listen. You're going to turn off the TV and you're going to walk in there and you're going to say, how was your day? And you're going to wait for the answer. Whew. Talk about inner critics. Ephesians 3 says it this way, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may do what? Strengthen you with power through his spirit. Don't we all need that? In your inner being so Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray, I love this, one of my favorite verses. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with the Lord's holy people. What's the power for? To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that love. So it means not only will you know about it, but you'll know it, that love that surpasses knowledge. Why? So you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Because here's the deal. If you spend time in God's word, and you spend time in prayer, and you allow him to fill you up, then what comes out of you during the day is not hatred and anger and criticism. What comes out of you during the day is his love, his power, his strength, which we all need. I like this Albert Einstein quote. Great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. If you believe your enemies, you'll believe lies about yourself. Number three, speak his truth and pray for strength. Dr. Carl Menninger, a world-famous psychiatrist, was answering questions after giving a lecture on mental health when one person asked, what would you advise someone to do if they felt a nervous breakdown coming on? Most people expected the doctor to say, consult a psychiatrist or take some medicine or something else. Instead, he said, lock up your house, go across the railroad tracks, find someone in need, and do something to help that person. Too many times we're so focused on ourselves, our own issues, on our critics, that we don't realize the answer is not to answer them, but to do what God's called us to do. Go back to that direction signal and say, God, I'm going to read your word. I'm going to spend time in your word. I'm going to let you give me the direction for my life, and then I'm going to do it. I sent him this reply, nothing like what you are saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. Some of you, when you feel yourself say, nobody cares about you, you need to out loud say, that is not true. Amen. Now, if you're in Burger King, they're going to freak out if you do that. So don't <laughs> do it out loud there. But if you're in your car and you're having one of those negative discussions, <laughs> that discussion sounds like that. <laughs> Then you need to out loud say, God, I want to do whatever you've called me to do regardless of how I feel today. 
They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. What did he pray for? He prayed for the very problem he was dealing with. What problem are you dealing with? Say, God, help me with, and you fill in the blank. In Galatians 6, 9, it says it this way. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Do you know why it says that? Because everybody feels like giving up. Mother Teresa had this poem on her wall, and she rewrote it. It's a little different. The original was a little different, but I like her version better. It's called Anyway. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you'll win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be good enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, and this is one of the parts she added, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. I want to encourage you. Find out what God wants you to do and do it. Whether or not you're criticized from outside or whether you're criticized from inside, I want to encourage you to say, God, strengthen my hands. Help me to do what you call me to do and not quit when I don't feel good. Help me to do what you call me to do. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. You can come up after the service say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. And I'd love to be a part of you praying and saying, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm messed up. And I know Jesus died for my sins and rose again, and I want to surrender my life to him today. Maybe you're here today, and as a Christian, when I talk about criticism, boy, you know those voices well. Just pray that God would begin to do a work in you. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for each one here. I pray that you would bless them. Lord, I pray for those today who are struggling with the, that inner critic, that, that critic that is attacking them from inside. Lord, I also pray for that one who may actually have adversaries, those who go after them. Lord, would you strengthen their hands? Lord, would you fill them with your love, even when they're tired? I pray for that one who's just tired today, that you would renew their strength as they wait on you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name.